Join me in the invocation. God, we have ventured worlds undreamed of since the childhood of our race, known the ecstasy of winging through realms of space and probed the secrets of the atom yielding unimagined power, facing us with life's destruction for our most triumphant hour. As each horizon beckons, may it challenge us anew Children of creative purpose, serving others, honoring you, may our dreams prove rich with promise, each endeavor well begun. Great creator, give us guidance till our goals and yours are one. Amen. You may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of this college, Dr. Axel Steuer. This annual Nobel Conference is a high point in the life of Gustavus Adolphus College. It both highlights the Swedish heritage of Gustavus perhaps more significantly, underscores the college's commitment to excellence in science education. We are pleased and honored that leading scholars from both coasts and from the American heartland have today converged, along with no nearly 4,000 visitors on our campus to reflect upon what, without any hyperbole, must be called the big picture. For 27 years now, the Nobel Committee in Stockholm, Sweden has designated Gustavus Adolphus College as the official North American site of the annual Nobel Conference. While we are pleased with this recognition, we are even more pleased to play a role in bringing to the American people, to all of those interested in participating in the conversation taking place at the very frontiers of science, some of today's most distinguished scientists and most insightful interpreters of science. On behalf of all of us at Gustavus Adolphus College, I extend a warm welcome to all of you, the participants in this Nobel Conference on the Evolving Cosmos. As president of Gustavus Adolphus College, I now declare the 27th annual Nobel Conference open. The originator of the idea of this conference and its chairman, the godfather of Gustavus physicists and astrophysicists who are doing their thing all over the universe, my dear colleague and friend from the Department of Physics, Dr. Richard Fuller. On behalf of the Nobel Committee, I welcome you to this Nobel Conference. I invite you to join us in a celebration of what we have come to think of as one of the great exciting eras of human experience of what we know about the universe and how we know it. I would like to introduce to you at this time the speakers for this year's conference. I will start, you go to my left first, Professor Timothy Ferris, Professor of Journalism and Astronomy, University of California, Berkeley. Emeritus Distinguished Professor William A. Fowler, California Institute of Technology. <laughs> professor of Astronomy, Research Professor at Smithsonian Observatory, Professor Margaret Geller. Professor of Physics 
University of Massachusetts, Ernan McMullen. Excuse me. Notre Dame, excuse me. <laughs> Professor of Philosophy at Notre Dame, Ernan McMullen. <laughs> Professor of Physics at University of Massachusetts, William Harrison. <laughs> Distinguished Emeritus Professor, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Philip Morrison. And now my colleague, Michael Vitzton from our math department will introduce the first speaker for today. Yes. We will take the time to come down ourselves, uh, some of us, and to go to the left. Edward Harrison was born in London, England. He attended Sir John Cass College of London University and did his graduate work at the Institute of Physics. From 1948 to 1964, Dr. Harrison was with the English Atomic Energy Establishment. And from 1964 to 1965, he was principal scientist at the Rutherford High Energy Laboratory in England. Since 1966, Dr. Harrison has been a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and a professor of astronomy in the five colleges astronomy department. The five colleges being Amherst, Hampshire, Mount Holyoke, Smith, and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. In 1987, Dr. Harrison was appointed Distinguished Professor of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Massachusetts. His recent books include Cosmolo Cosmology, The Science of the Universe, Masks of the Universe, and Darkness at Night, The History of a Cosmological Riddle. <coughs> Professor Harrison, in, in his book, Cosmology, describes our continual quest to understand the universe. We search the sky, the earth, and within ourselves, and wonder about the universe. What is it all about? Why did it all begin? How will it all end? And what is the meaning of life? As one who vividly recalls sitting out under the starry sky on warm summer evenings and asking himself just such questions, it is truly an honor for me to introduce Edward Harrison, who will speak to us on the topic, Have You Seen the Big Bang Lately? I need help then. Oh, here we are. Okay. Uh, the universe evolves, and so does our view of the universe. Uh, the uh, standard model of the universe of today is totally unlike the standard model of 100 years ago, 
and perhaps quite unlike the standard model that will exist in 100 years' time. I shall make comments on, uh, some comments on how our view of the universe has changed uh, and use as a connecting theme uh, the riddle of why, this, why the night sky is dark, the, dark uh, the riddle of cosmic darkness. And here is the, here is the view, the standard view of uh, the universe in the Middle Ages. The Earth is at the center, surrounded by an atmosphere, the celestial spheres, and outside in some mysterious extra cosmic realm is God looking down on it all. And uh, the, the medieval universe reached its peak uh, in the late 13th century when Dante in the Divine Comedy ascended the, uh, the celestial spheres, the Moon, <coughs> Mercury, uh, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the sphere of stars, the eight celestial spheres. And as he ascends, the light grows brighter, and then at the rim of the universe, he looks over and sees on the other side a mirror image, uh, the, uh, a, a universe of angelic spheres, blazing with light. Uh, the angels, the archangels, and these angelic spheres, of which there are eight. Go all the way into the, the seraphim, the cherubim, and at the center is God. This grand unified picture of the universe with God and the earth as antipodes uh, was, is perhaps the, 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 the greatest image the human mind has ever had of the universe. It contained everything. It accommodated heaven and the spirit of man, of man and and it gave meaning and purpose to life on earth. Then came the scientific revolution. The, the Copernican revolution, the earth was moved from the center and replaced by the sun. The sphere of stars remained. Uh, this was in the, uh, in the 16th century. And then, 30 years later, in 1576, Thomas Deeks of London tore away the outer sphere of stars and dispersed them throughout infinite space. And he wrote, he wrote, uh, concerning the stars, so see me they of lessy and lesser quantity, even till our sighty, being ye not able farther to reach ye or conceive ye, the greatest part rest by reason of their wonderful distance, invisible unto us. Even at this early stage, uh, there was concern about distributing an infinite number of stars in the universe. Why does the sky at night remain dark? And it begins in this rudimentary fashion. But let me make it clear, what is the riddle? If space has no edge, and if it's endless, and if the stars are distributed endlessly, then every line of sight away from Earth into the depths of space must ultimately intercept the surface of a star. There should be no dark gaps between the stars. The whole sky should be covered with stars, and uh, and night should and starlight should the sky should blaze with starlight. It's very similar to uh, being in a forest. Uh, you look between the stars to a background of tree tree. Uh, you look between the trees and see a background of tree trunks, 
it's very easy to work out how far can you see in a forest, particularly if it's like this. Uh, you just take the average, just take the area occupied by one tree and divide that by the width of a tree trunk. And that will give you the distance an arrow will fly in the forest before hitting a tree on the average. So if, if, if the separating distance is 10 meters, next time you're in a forest, do this calculation. If, if, if the, uh, a good forest, uh, no, no scrubby underbrush. Uh, if the distance between the trees is say 10 meters, 10 yards, uh, uh, the area is 100 square meters, and if the width is, say, half a meter, that means you can see on the average 200 meters uh, to this background of tree trunks. And you can do a similar calculation for the stars. And in fact, uh, well, let me point out, this riddle has teased uh, astronomers and uh, almost every astronomer in the history since, uh, since the sixth since the 17th century has struggled and, and commented and made contributions to this problem. And, uh, and it's helped to shape uh, our, our, our understanding of the universe. Uh, Halley, Edmund Halley of Comet fame, fame had a go at it. Uh, he, he, he's got endless, it's a Newtonian mechanistic universe now. Uh, infinite, and the stars stretch away endlessly. So Halley constructed these shells of equal thickness, and it's fairly evident that uh, each succeeding shell contains more stars. But each star, uh, as the shells go out, contributes less light to the observer at the center and so it works out that each shell contributes an equal amount of light. But Halley stumbled in his argument and failed to draw that conclusion. And he came, he finished up with the same conclusion that Higgs had. The individual stars, distant stars, are so feeble that their rays do not register uh, on, the, on the retina of the eye. And that's why the sky is dark, he said. Now, the guy who put it all right, did all the calculations, uh, was a young Swiss mathematician 20 years after Halley, 1740, uh, de Chezot. He did all the calculations. He didn't make Halley's mistake. And furthermore, he didn't bother with uh, calculating the radiation from each star looked at it from a different point of view. Each star of finite size covers a little bit of the sky. If you're going, and also, if the, if the, the whole sky is, is 180,000 times bigger than the size of the sun's disk. So if you're going to cover the sky with stars similar to the sun, then starlight from this blazing uh, canopy should be 180,000 times more intense than, than, uh, than sunlight. He did the calculations, uh, adding shells, uh, and he worked out that the distance he had to add shells up to cover the sky uh, was a trillion, well, a trillion is a million million. It was uh, a trillion trillion Sun Earth distances. And the number of stars to cover the sky was a trillion, 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 10 to the 48. Uh, so, why is the sky not uh, blazing bright? Uh, de Chezot um, uh, uh, thought that there must be something in space that's uh, absorbing the starlight. He postulated an interstellar absorbing medium uh, that, uh, that blocked out the starlight. But very soon after that, no, I beg your pardon, uh, we have to come forward 80 years uh, to, to Wil Wilhelm Olbers, who 
And uh, this riddle now enjoys the name of Olbers Paradox uh, due to a lack of uh, a historical understanding in, among scientists. It's been attributed to Olbers. Olbers did the same calculations as Chazot, also came to the conclusion uh, that it's the absorption of starlight that explains the darkness of night. Now, if you look up at the sky and uh, you see a few luminous bodies and all the rest is dark, uh, the, uh, the way I have described this puzzle is that unseen stars cover the entire sky. And it, interpretation A is the, the riddle is the missing starlight. Where has the starlight gone of all these stars that cover the sky? Well, interpretation B, what we see is what we've got. Uh, the darkness is there, and there are no stars. And then the riddle is, tell us where the stars have gone. What has happened to the missing stars that should be there? Now, uh, Chazot and Olbers adopted interpretation A. Now, uh, a, 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 just, a, 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 a sort of a, a way, uh, interpretation uh, A is the dark, uh, B is that the dark gaps are there. And so, uh, and if there's an infinite number of stars, then as a jest, it was suggested, they all hide behind each other in rows. <laughs> and that, that is one, uh, there have been many solutions of the riddle. Uh, this is the, the most humorous. Well, I'm not going to go step by step through all the centuries uh, s uh, up to present. I, I'll just make one or two comments that uh, uh, in 1750, uh, Wright, Thomas Wright, uh, interpreted all the fuzzy patches on the sky as Milky Ways, similar to our own Milky Way, and he postulated an endless universe of galaxies. Uh, it's a mind-boggling picture that Kant worked on and developed, but it was never very popular until the century. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the sort of theories or out views of the universe alternated uh, in different ways and uh, the uh, this the always space is infinite endless but the distribution of stars uh, uh, is is in some ways finite the the the, the, the many get the many galaxy universe uh, has not was not very popular and uh, the the, uh, the, the view that arose and became more and more popular and climaxed in the Victorian era uh, was that the, the galaxy is the only system of stars and that beyond the galaxy is a, an extra Monday, well, an extra cosmic space that is endless and dark and starless. And Agnes Clerk, the historian, exact, almost exactly a hundred years ago, wrote, and now this is the standard model of the universe of a hundred years ago to which every astron astronomer subscribed. But the probability amounts almost to certainty. You hear the, hear the certain the certainty has been echoed nowadays in, in, uh, in similar words, but a different picture. Almost a certainty that star-strewn space is of measurable dimensions, for from innumerable stars, a limitless sum total of radiations should be derived by which darkness will be banished from our skies. Uh, she is, of course, saying why the stars cannot be, cannot be everywhere. Uh, 
and the, the intense inane, glowing with the, the mingled beams of suns, individually in, indistinguishable, would bewilder our feeble senses uh, with its monotonous splendor. Uh, this laying bare, so to speak, of the Empyrean would be the simple and certain result of the continuance of sidereal objects comparable with that prevailing in our neighborhood. So, so, uh, so the darkness of the night sky is really, we look out between the stars and we see the darkness of the extra cosmic vo uh, void, which is a slightly mysterious place. Uh, it inherits its mystery from the medieval universe. Somewhere out here, in the Victorian universe lurks God and heaven. And my first lesson in cosmology was at Sunday school. Uh, when uh, uh, the, 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 the teacher, when asked, uh, where is heaven, pointed out. And, uh, that, and, and she meant out here. It's a mysterious extra mundane space. Now, there is a strange thing about the history of, of astronomy and of science, and uh, which uh, ever since uh, Ole Roma uh, in, uh, in 1676 discovered that light propagates at finite speed, and it takes eight minutes to travel from the sun to the earth. The fact that we see the sun as it was 500 seconds ago and the nearest stars as they were uh, four or five years ago. Newton knew the, the nearest stars were four or five light years uh, away. Uh, and, uh, but nobody, even though they knew the speed of light, ever put together the fact that when you look out vast distances in space, you also look back vast periods in time. There was almost, it seems, some cons conspiracy to suppress this fact. Most, most astronomers were ordained ministers. And if, uh, and, 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 and sensitive of their patronage, and imagine an astronomer telling the bishop uh, that he had looked through his telescope the previous night back to the creation of the universe. Uh, it, uh, the, there is this reluctance. There is, throughout the centuries, there's been this strong reluctance to, to put together light travel uh, and measure, look, uh, think of light travel, time and distances. And uh, the occasional ref as astronomers were always willing to wax about the vastness and uh, the, the glory of the heavens, but never to talk about the fact that they were looking back millions of years in time. And, uh, and why was that? Well, it was the mosaic chronology and uh, the cultural belief among Jews, Christians, and Muslims uh, that God had created the universe only thousands of years ago. And that was a sensitive issue. And here the astronomers had evidence at their fingertips uh, that the universe was, well, William Herschel knew it and even mentioned it, that the universe uh, was, uh, was millions of years old. So we look out back, in t out in space, and because of the finite speed of light, we look back in time. And if you're going to look between the stars, uh, you, your line of sight must end somewhere at the beginning of the universe. And uh, it was Mark Twain who, who pointed out that as the universe ages, we see more of it. Now, you see, here we are, moving forward in time, can that be seen? And as we go forward in time, so the visible universe gets bigger and bigger. 
if the universe is only one year old, uh, then you can only see one light year. And so a year after the creation, there were no stars. Uh, you would have to wait for five years. And uh, if you waited 5,000 years, uh, you would then be seeing less than 1% of the galaxy. Now, it's... Uh, Yeah, oh yeah, the, 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 the person who put this all together in, in, a, in a wonderful fashion was Lord Kelvin. Uh, the first year of the century, he worked out, took, took into account the finite lifetime of stars, and he showed there were not enough stars in the visible universe, uh, luminous stars, that uh, would... Uh, uh, cover the sky. And uh, this, uh, so Kelvin showed that in the static universe, he assumed that space was infinite and, if, and, and uh, even uh, allowed, took the assumption that stars extend endlessly. And if stars only can be luminous for uh, tens of millions of years, uh, then you are only going to, you look out more than 10 million light years, you're looking back to the time before the stars were luminous. You see the darkness. You see the darkness before the birth of stars. Interpretation B. Uh, at this paper by Calvin, uh, for strange reasons, was, uh, was forgotten. Uh, it's not even included in his collected works. Uh, in the last, uh, let me mention one of the many solutions that have been proposed. In the last century, uh, there was this idea, one, one could solve the riddle by supposing that space is indeed edgeless, uh, unbounded, but it's finite in the same way as the surface of a sphere. Uh, you could travel in the universe and eventually come back uh, in the opposite direction. And uh, so, but that, and it, it was proposed that this solved the riddle. Uh, but in fact, the line of sight will wind in, around and around the universe until it does intercept a star. You would still see uh, 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 a background of stars covering the sky. They would, of course, be multiple images or things of that kind. So we come to the 20th century. General relativity reached its final form in 1917. Observations established that the universe was expanding. And, and by the, uh, the middle of the century, uh, there were various models of the, for the expansion of the universe. Can uh, people see this? I take that murmur to mean yes. Uh, there, there, was, uh, uh, there were the Big Bang type of models, other models that didn't have a Big Bang. And uh, the Big Bang it, it was a disreputable thing to study back in those days. Uh, very few had the courage to write about it. Uh, it. The Big Bang was proposed by a Russian in 1922. And what else could you expect from the Bolshevik Revolution? <laughs> Five years later, it was explored and brilliant work was done by a Belgian priest. What else can you expect a priest to do but think about uh, the beginning and that kind of thing? But reputable scientists like Eddington would have nothing to do with it. Big, the Big Bang smacked of the creation myths of primitive societies. Uh, you were bringing God into the picture and God forbid, said Eddington. And so the steady state arose, and a universe that expanded 
infinitely, uh, for an, uh, 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 over, over an eternity and never had any beginning. Uh, and, uh, and also, I forgot to mention George Gamow. One can't leave him out. He, he um, uh, studied the physics of the early universe in its dense and hot state. But his work drew very little attention because it still had this disreputable uh, uh, appearance to the subject. And also, of course, he was a slightly crazy Russian. And, uh, and at least this aspect of his work was largely neglected. But then it came 1965 and the discovery of the Big Bang. And what is so remarkable in the history of cosmology is suddenly the Big Bang became respectable to study. Everybody jumped in on the subject, including myself. And uh, what was discovered was that the, was the afterglow of the Big Bang. The universe is filled with dense infrared radiation of a temperature of about three degrees Kelvin. If you go out and hold your hand up to the sky for one second, a thousand trillion photons of this radiation will strike it. It's a dense radiation that floods the universe and, and descends from the, the Big Bang. We can't see it with the naked eye, but instruments detect it. Now, uh, okay, okay, uh, uh, I should point out that uh, uh, probably, I should have pointed out following this, uh, there was this uh, steady state picture of the universe of historical interest uh, that, and, and, and advocates of that theory uh, point said that the darkness of the night sky is due to uh, the expansion of the universe. Go out at night and note the state of darkness of the night sky, and you have direct evidence that the universe is expanding. And it's the redshift effect, that as waves, light waves propagate in space, the expansion of space, space draws out the wavelengths and moves the radiation toward the red end of the spectrum. And so the light moves out of the visible region. And that's why the sky is dark at night. That was the explanation. Well, it was so, so uh, sensational, uh, an explanation, that it was applied to every model of the universe. You see, it's in interpretation A. The sky is covered with stars. We don't see the stars because the, the most distant stars have been redshifted into invisibility. But, uh, it turned out later with calculations that the redshift is explanation is true for uh, only for the steady state universe. Kelvin had shown that the age of the universe was the explanation of why the sky is dark at night. The universe isn't old enough for the light to have reached us from all the stars so distant away that are needed to cover the sky. And if it's true, if Kelvin's explanation is true in a static universe, then also it must be in, true in an expanding universe. Expansion is only going to make it even darker. Well, uh, here we are, the Big Bang. Uh, and let me just say a word or two in preparation for what others might say afterwards. Uh, uh, here's the universe. Uh, in time, uh, here's time, and as we go back in time, uh, the universe gets more dense. And here we are, uh, 10 to the 10, 10 billion years, which is about uh, a million trillion seconds, 10 to the 18. We don't have to go back, back very far uh, to when the universe was about a billion years old, and the galaxies start forming, and the stars. Uh, before that, there is a, a period back to when the universe was a million years old. Uh, there were these dark ages 
uh, which we just don't understand. We don't know what was happening. It's all the, here, great globes of gas were forming or fragmenting out of the expansion of the universe to lay the foundations of uh, a structured universe. We just do not know what caused that. So we go back to when the universe is a million years old and we've reached the Big Bang, the end of the early universe. All the radiation decouples and propagates through space, and that's what we see nowadays. And then we go through this, we enter into the Big Bang, a world of brilliant silence. As you go back, it gets more and more intense, the light uh, and brighter. And we you can journey through this strange era right back to when the universe was about one second old. It's the beginning of the radiation era, and only in the first few hundred seconds of the radiation era, a large quantity of hydrogen gets burned. 25% of the hydrogen in the universe gets burned into helium. But the whole universe is a hydrogen bomb. But the energy in the universe is so immense, it's only a small perturbation in the history of the universe. Uh, now, the universe is one second old. How can one think of going back earlier? Well, let me point out to you that as you go back, things speed up, and you have to look at time logarithmically. More of cosmic history happened in the first second than has happened in the subsequent 10 to the 18 seconds. We can go right back to 10 to the minus 43 seconds, and here we can only come forward from 18 orders of magnitude. Well, we can go right back. Uh, let me just whiz through. Oh, I whiz. Uh, let me just uh, say, the universe probably began at 10 to the minus, possibly began at 10 to the minus 43 seconds. It then enters into a whiz-bang era called inflation. It's, it's only a very tiny universe to begin with, but inflation makes it big and, and fills it with matter. So we go through this inflation, and then we get launched into a giant universe uh, such as we are, we're in now. Well, let's see. After the whiz-bang era comes a long quark era, which... Uh, terminates uh, in hadrons, uh, the hadron era, short-lived. We go into a lepton era, which is here. The universe is dominated with electrons and positrons and neutrinos and photons. And then we come eventually to the radiation era. So, how am I for time? How many more minutes? Fifteen? I've been whizzing too quickly. So, okay, uh, so uh, once again we have this picture. Uh, we're looking back through the stars. We're in an expanding universe, and of course it's highly structured. Uh, it contains galaxies. Uh, that stretch away. Uh, to the, the limits of the visible universe. Uh, here we are pushing out to the limits of the, the visible universe, and the sky is beginning to fill in with all the distant galaxies. Almost we're building up a background of galaxies. Having failed to make a, a background of stars, we're succeeding with the background of galaxies. So we look out between the luminous bodies of the expanding universe, and a line of sight goes back to the, to the Big Bang, goes back to the end of the radiation era, back to when the universe was a million years old. We see across we see every line of sight from the eye away from Earth terminates in the Big Bang. The Big Bang covers the entire sky. Uh, uh, 
and, uh, and here we are looking back to the Big Bang. Creation, or whatever you want to call it, covers the entire sky. And of course, this is, this is a startling statement to make. And it's part of the fault of using this expression, Big Bang. And the Big Bang is not a point in space. The Big Bang fills the entire universe. And it's really a period in the early history of the universe. The early universe is the academic expression. Uh, Hoyle introduced the Big Bang in a wreath lecture as a, a, a pejorative expression because he favored the steady state universe and scornfully referred to the Big Bang. And, and his scorn actually uh, reflected the feeling of most people concerning this, this disreputable idea of the Big Bang. So here, so here is, so here we are approaching the end of the 20th century. And we have a standard model of the universe, extraordinary and remarkable in many ways. And in the history of this, the history of the thread I have followed, we have come to eventually to interpretation B. But the sky is not covered with unseen stars. It's covered instead by the, by the, by the uh, uh, Big Bang that's been uh, uh, redshifted into uh, an infrared gloom that is invisible to the naked eye. Uh, so I think that is a, 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 a really startling uh, 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 stage we've come to in modern cosmology and uh, we have yet to see during the next century how this picture is going to get changed or overthrown. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, yes. 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 How was the microphone? Was it? Take just a, just a moment here. I'm on. No, I'm not on. I am on. Yes, yes, I'm coming on. We're almost here. Okay. We're almost here. Yes, we are here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, I hope there are some, some students there with cards. Yes, I see someone along the side here for you to ask uh, questions uh, of the panelists. If you would write it out and hand it back to them uh, immediately, uh, then we will have them come up here. And we'll have an opportunity to use them through the day and through the, uh, even, even tomorrow if the question's good enough. We thank Dr. Harrison for his opening talk, and here is uh, Professor Fuller. Perhaps there would be some responses while we wait for the cards from a panelist. Get that thing on the, get your mic up close to you, okay. when, you uh, when you speak. Would you like to comment? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Timothy. Let's get, we can get this microphone let's going. Let's get some of those people out there. Okay. Can you, uh, hold on just a minute. All right. Hold on. 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 H
just just hold it, or you can do it yours. And I'm going to ask you a Kobe question. If that's all right. He's going to ask a Kobe a Kobe question. Yes. Go ahead. Just a moment. First, we'll get the attention. Okay. Sounds very, sounds very May we have your attention, please, those of you who are in, in the building? Good. Then we can begin with the questions. Timothy Ferris. Thank you. Uh, I'll see if I get a mic here. Can you hear me yet? Yes, here we are. No, you still can't hear me. If you can't hear me, raise your hand. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to ask Professor Harrison if he uh, would uh, care to say a few words about the... Uh, uh, results of the uh, COBE satellite uh, and its observations of the cosmic background radiation, which uh, marked, it seems to me, such a remarkable uh, uh, chapter in the confirmation of theory by experiment. So, what do you want to know? <laughs> um, given the title of... Hello? Given the, <laughs> given the title of your... Uh, Talk. I thought you might want to comment about the uh, the uh, results obtained by the uh, cosmic background uh, satellite and its relevance to the uh, to the Big Bang theory. Um, well, the uh, this thermal radiation is uh, is in uh, the last year or so. Been dis it's been discovered that it's, it's uh, remarkably isotropic. It's the same in all directions uh, to within about one part in a hundred thousand. And this, uh, after subtracting out the fact that, uh, that uh, the solar system is in motion in the universe, if you mo uh, this, uh, this background radiation gives us a, a a, a, a preferred space that's homogeneous and isotropic in which, uh, once again, absolute motion has been restored. Uh, and uh, if we subtract out our motion of about 600 kilometers a second from it, then it is, this has this high degree of isotropy. And that is, it, that, 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 that uh, is a puzzle. It, it agrees with the fact one might expect uh, uh, the early universe to be isotropic, but it is, uh, it is in conflict to some degree uh, with the fact that optically uh, the universe is emerging as highly structured. And Margaret Geller knows more about that than I, than I do. And uh, <coughs> structure, uh, is evident in the universe on the on the scale of galaxies, clusters of galaxies, superclusters, great voids, and uh, and and how is it possible that uh, an expanding universe that then uh, that that uh, forms all this structure can emerge out of a dense radiation field and leave that radiation field without any, almost any irregularity at all. You'd expect some, uh, some uh, irregularity in the cosmic radiation that mimics or relates to the fact that optically the universe is highly structured. Any other panelists with, with questions or comments? I have a question of more historical uh, nature, which I was fascinated by the description of an early recognition of the time that buries the, the infinite star uh, sphere, if it, if it existed, by Mark Twain. And I seem to recall also that Edgar Allan Poe had an early insight about this. Do, do, do you believe that it, that is the case? Well, Mark, Mark Twain, in his uh, <coughs> posthumously... Hello? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mark Twain, in his posthumously published Letters from Earth, mentioned uh, uh, mentioned uh, that uh, on the day of creation there would be no stars. You'd have to wait <coughs> a few years for the first star to emerge. 
and then, uh, then, uh, and, and then uh, more and more stars uh, would cover the sky. And uh, his, uh, his, uh, his, his relatives and trustees suppressed uh, this, uh, this heretical uh, work. Uh, it, it didn't fit in with the uh, sedate uh, society of Connecticut. So, uh, and, and this really does indicate how cosmology is influenced very strongly by fashions of thought. Edgar Allan Poe was, a, 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 was another radical, uh, not accepted by the establishment. And he also, uh, in his, uh, his uh, essay, a year before he died, uh, Eureka, uh, pointed out that the darkness of the night sky might be because the universe is not old enough for the light from distant stars to reach us. But, uh, but you see, the history of this puzzle is full of these surmises, and it's rare that you find a, 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 a proper calculation. Uh, and, and I tried to keep to those people that did the calculations. You know, lots of opinions, but uh, very few calculations. De Chazot and Lord Calvin are really the two champions in this subject. Other comments from the panelists? We have a question uh, from the audience. From the hypothesis discussed, do you feel that the universe is headed uh, for the entropy death? Um, um, well, I, I wish the speaker would tell me what he or she means by entropy. Then I would know on what level to answer this question. But, uh, but uh, uh, <coughs> people. In the last century, uh, it was feared that the universe would eventually suffer a heat death. Later on, that was then expressed in terms of an entropy death. But the, the more fearsome, uh, but entropy is by and large conserved, and all the entropy is in the microwave radiation. Stars pouring out, pouring their hearts out in, in, in starlight will never auto match the entropy of the universe is all stored in the microwave background radiation the no what is more more fearsome nowadays is not the uh, heat death it's the energy death of the universe because uh, uh, Fr freeman dyson has looked ahead a long way and uh, when all the stars have died and all accessible energy, all forms of accessible energy have, have, have disappeared. How is life going to survive in a universe that expands forever, getting darker and darker? And Friedman Dyson's answer to this is that, okay, uh, uh, let's slow up life. Uh, living 100 years in a universe 10 billion years old is no different from living a million years at 10,000 times slower in a universe that's, uh, oh, I, don't, I can't do the calculation, that is anyway, 10 to the, that is 10,000 billion years old or something. Uh, and you can go into long periods of hibernation, so you, you, you husband or preserve these diminishing energy resources. But I think all this uh, is rather is rather missing the point. Uh, uh, human beings have risen to the level of intelligence in the last million years. Can we imagine what, if human beings survive, what level of intelligence they will achieve in another million years? And a million years is nothing on the time scale of the universe. What will, in, what will, in, what level of intelligence will intelligence have attained in a billion years' time. 
or in a hundred billion years time. I personally think that intelligent life will have taken over the control of the universe. It will not be trying to eke out slender reserves of energy. Once you harness the expansion of the universe, the ultimate form of unlimited energy, uh, then, then there's no need to worry about an energy death. The fate of intelligent, <laughs> fate of intelligent life in the universe is surely to take over control of the universe. Uh, back on the question of the uh, fact that the cosmic background radiation is so uniform across the sky, uh, the observations say it's something like at most one part in the 10 to the fifth. Uh, in your point of view, Ed, uh, what is the ultimate limit in your way of thinking? Is it one part in 10 to the sixth? You see, those of us who believe in, in the inhomogeneous universe are in real trouble because we, we can only get to 10 to the minus four. But in, in your way of looking at things, how low can you go? Well, it's uh, almost one, one three, one's close to that limit within a factor of two or three. And that is even then that's slimming down the theoretical options. So you, you, it's, a, it's, it's a matter of uh, anxiety among theoreticians. So if the observers go any further, even in your point of view, you'll be in trouble. Yes, and, mm -hmm. and there, there rests the reason why, for thinking, the standard model of 100 years' time might be different. Yeah. Yes. Professor Morrison? I'm a little skeptical about this. <laughs> of course, we're not in possession of all the, the theoretical structure to fill in what we don't know. Between the time of the recombination and the cooling of the microwave, the recombination of the atoms that are giving off the microwave, into neutral transparent material, and the time we can see that uh, the Professor Geller and the optical people see so well with all this rich structure of groups and voids, there's a lot to be filled in. We have strong reason to believe, not, not uh, definite, but strong reason, there's a lot of matter we don't even know about, which matter can change, which can be of several types. I would say that I, I would not give up on this general picture and I'll say that more, I have a full time, full half hour, to, an hour to do that with, uh, for almost any degree of isotopy. The more isotropic it is, the better I like it. Because what I say is new processes will be needed to make the, 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 uh, the galaxies in their distribution, but they're indicated strongly by the fact, the probability, that we don't see all the matter, we don't even know what kind of matter it is, how are we gonna calculate what kind of galaxies are made out of stuff that we don't know about at all, can't even give a name to for sure, which can even change while it's going on. So I think that we're, it's very premature to take that worry, but it does show one very strong thing, which I'm going to emphasize, that there was a uniform time and now there is an unstable gravitational coagulation time, and both of those things are to be expected from, from what we know, and that's very reasonable. Now that it's all filled out, that we have the last story, no, I don't know, but I strongly suspect that 100 years from now, we're debating this kind of thing and not the general picture of the isotropy and the coagulation. Um, I'd like to just uh, make a comment that I agree with uh, Philip Morrison's view that it's not the global Big Bang picture that we have trouble with. It's making the structure, making galaxies, making us. It's how the furniture of the universe essentially originates. And the, the problem that we have is that we have a picture of the universe when it was about uh, 100,000 years old, that's what, the big, that's what this microwave radiation shows us. It's a picture, it's the photons from this epoch when the radiation was last scattered and it tells us that the early universe was very smooth. And as I'll show you tomorrow, we have a picture of what the universe is like today, 10 or 20 billion years later. So it's like going into a movie theater at the beginning of the movie, then you fall asleep and you suddenly wake up at the end and you wonder what in the world happened in between. And there's an awful lot that can go on in between and we don't really know all the things that might have happened in between. Fortunately, one of the things that's happening now is that large telescopes are being built on the ground and uh, as Professor Harrison said, one of the wonderful things about the universe is that it's a sort of time machine. When you look out in space, you look back in time. So if we can't figure out by pure thought how the objects in the universe got to be here, we'll observe it one day. Other comments? 
from the panel. We have a couple of questions, and I wondered how long it would take before the big the black holes got into the picture, but we have two questions involving black holes. Uh, after the Big Bang, when and how did black holes develop? Anybody want to uh, address that one? Are there any? <laughs> Give it to Edward. <laughs> Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? <laughs> Phil, Professor I'll a black hole when I see one. I see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, one of the comments was, couldn't the darkness of the farthest stars be caused by black holes sucking the light out of the universe? <laughs> yes. oh, I like uh, Professor Harrison. Uh, the, the, uh, the same uh, person who made the jest about stars lining up one behind the other was Edward Fournier de Elba. He was an engineer who broadcast television pictures from London in 1920. And he devoted his life to trying to heal Anglo-Irish relations. And he proposed many solutions of this, uh, of this uh, riddle in a wonderful book, small book, published in 1907. And he said one possibility is that Perhaps only one star in 10 billion is luminous, and uh, all the rest are dark. And so when we look out at nighttime at the sky, it is indeed covered with stars, but most of them are not luminous. Now, you see, you, you're not, in, in a sense, there is the non-luminous stars are blocking the radiation we can't see more luminous stars. It's a background of non-luminous stars that is sucking radiation, if you like, or it's blocking the, 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 it's absorbing the radiation from other stars. But of course, uh, that, 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 uh, even in his day, he knew that was uh, an unlikely explanation. We have a, another question. During the inflationary period, did the universe expand at a rate that exceeded the speed of light? Oh, certainly. Certainly. Uh, if I'm with you, if I'm with you, uh, I don't want to get launched on this subject uh, because, uh, because uh, you see, the universe certainly expands. If, if the, the, the expansion of the universe increases linearly with distance, and so if the universe is infinite in extent, then bodies at infinite distance are receding from us at infinite speed. And this, one has to, has to realize that, uh, that uh, we're now in uh, the framework of general relativity. And space has become not only curved, but it's also become dynamic. Uh, uh, it's become part of the physical universe. If you're going to create the universe, you've got to create space with it because it is part of the physical scheme of things. And when the universe expands, it's not bodies moving through space. In that case, they will be limited by uh, special relativity. The motion light speed will be the limit. But it's the expansion of space. And Bodies are stationary in space, and it's this expansion of space that wafts everything apart. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, the laws of expanding space are governed by general relativity and not by special relativity. So 10 billion light years out from here, space is receding at the speed of light. And objects beyond there are receding faster, and objects nearer are receding less slow. And a ray, a, ray, a ray of light traveling toward us at, 10, at a distance of 10 billion light years is actually stationary. It hurries towards us, toward us through space, but space is itself expanding and carrying it away. And so beyond 10 billion years, light traveling toward us, is, in fact, is actually receding. 
more question uh, from the audience. How do you account for the discontinuous accretion of matter from a smooth background? I'm sorry. <laughs> I received a note here, which said, what? I was supposed to answer the question. I didn't hear the question because I was busy. I, I have a note here which says, the movie wasn't so hot. It didn't have much of a plot. We fell asleep, our goose is cooked, our reputation is shot. Wake up, little Susie. From Don and Phil evenly. <laughs> Everly. Everly. I guess this came from Tim. Did this come from Tim? Yeah, that's the words to an Everly Brothers song. Oh, see, I'm naive. I wasn't educated about this, but it came from Tim Ferriss. <laughs> The, uh, the question was, uh, how do you make uh, galaxies out of a, a homogeneous, smooth, uh, isotropic universe? Well, if I knew the answer to that, I wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be sitting home writing it up. I think that's one of the fundamental questions. The, um, I mean, that's what I was saying before, that, that what we really don't understand is how the objects in the universe uh, originate. And it's very difficult. The problem the, the real um, conflict that we have is that we observe this very smooth early universe and now we observe a universe which is highly structured. And uh, the current models don't yield with, this, with, with reasonable, with what we think are reasonable assumptions, don't yield a match at the beginning and end of the movie. And so something's, something is missing from our understanding of how structure is made. But there's lots of room, as Phil said, for uh, lots of physics to go on. And we're missing a piece. I mean, just because we haven't thought of it doesn't mean that nature didn't. <laughs> uh, we shall return here at 1.30 for the lecture of Professor Morrison, Newton and anti-Newton. Let us say thanks to the panel.